Well, well, first of all, thanks uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak uh, and, and to Kara May for uh, organizing this. Um, as uh, Kara May said, I spent a lot of time working on the palm oil issue. I used to manage a palm oil plantation for about 10 years down in Costa Rica, so I know the business quite well um, and the process quite well. And when I joined WWF, uh, you know, I was not really expecting to uh, spend so much time on palm. Uh, thought I would be spending some, but then I got out to Indonesia and got to see the magnitude of the damage uh, that's going on and what's really happening on the ground out there. And for someone who has been in industrial ag, production agriculture for all of my professional life, really came away just incredibly shocked at what was happening because I'd never seen such kind of horrific and just wholesale slaughter of just everything in sight. And so really wanted to uh, dig into that and started to dig in. Um, let's see, how do I click this thing? Uh, really trying to figure out how can the industry out there in Indonesia and in Southeast Asia be transformed and to, to develop in a much more sustainable fashion. Uh, and it's a really complicated question. Um, uh, just because there are so many different facets to the to the palm oil issue that uh, not there is no one single solution to this problem uh, in terms of how do we move uh, this sector uh, it's interrelated with global trade increased incomes it's uh, uh, alleviating poverty a whole slew of multiple issues uh, and land use policies that are all colliding uh, because of this it's kind of a forward, uh, I do want to say, you know, we aren't against palm oil. Palm oil is not the problem. Uh, the problem is about how palm oil is being developed. Uh, it can be a great crop for development. Uh, it's a simple production technology. Uh, it's disease and pest tolerant. Uh, it produces 12 months out of the year, so it provides a steady cash flow, uh, especially for smallholders. Uh, which is important. Uh, very few inputs uh, from a chemical side, essentially just fertilizer and, and a little bit of herbicide. Uh, grows in variable soil types uh, and variable climates. It's highly profitable. Uh, and when done right, can actually enhance biodiversity and be carbon positive when done in certain landscapes and in certain regions. So palm oil could be a good thing, but the, the problem is, is just how, how uh, the sector has chosen to, uh, to expand it. Just as a little backdrop, kind of what's happened, most of you probably never heard of palm oil until you probably came here to really understand kind of what's happening, but you've seen a real transformation in the edible oils market or the vegetable oils market in the last 20 years or so. Uh, and palm oil, way back in 1980, uh, was only 4.9 million metric tons. Uh, and represented a small component of the overall uh, vegetable oil world. Now it dominates it. Uh, it's the leading oil, and it actually passed soy oil some, somewhere in uh, the early 90s in terms of the, the most traded oil. But now it totally dominates the vegetable oil sector, uh, then, then followed by soy. So it's just had this tremendous growth. And this growth really has been driven by a number of factors. Uh, primarily, one, you see the increasing incomes and prosperity in countries like India and in China, and, and the growth that uh, uh, and changing diets in those countries has really driven uh, increased consumption of palm oil and edible oils in general. When you take a look at where this expansion has taken place, uh, um, you can see uh, in the left-hand chart uh, just the growth of 2.5 million metric tons per year and still growing, still growing strong. We'll get into that a little bit later. But the growth is, also, is primarily centered in Indonesia and, and Malaysia in terms of the two kind of regional centers where uh, palm is produced. When you look at it from a global perspective, you've got Roughly 88% of global palm oil coming from two countries, with Indonesia having the lion's share. Uh, and then Thailand and Colombia following, and you are seeing the industry expanding in Colombia. And right now, you're, you know, in terms of public announcements, the next wave of expansion, there's something like 2.5 million hectares of claims that uh, 
companies will be uh, developing in, um, in West Africa, Western Central Africa. Now, when you take a look at the consumption of palm oil and where it's being consumed, this is not about the U.S., this is not about Europe, okay? And that's one of the big misperceptions many people have had, that it's, our consumption has been driving this. Uh, it's primarily India, it's Indonesia, China, then, then the EU in terms of representing uh, the, the primary uh, consumers of palm oil. Uh, but then the rest of it is consumed in a lot of the developing world. It is a widely used fry oil in the developing countries. And so this, this is really critical when you think about it in terms of how do you transform the sector when and you want to use market drivers, uh, i.e. your multinationals, if you will, how do you bring them to, a, uh, to this problem to actually have an impact on consumption and on use uh, in countries like China and India uh, and in products that they aren't producing? And so the WWF, we've gone through all of this and have really had to rethink our strategy. So I like to say we kind of had a Western-facing strategy on an Eastern-facing problem. And so things like RSPO are only part of the solution because getting certification into some of these countries is going to be much, much more difficult in terms of driving, driving that pressure. If you take a look at the growth, you can see um, just where it is and where U.S. consumption is relative to, to the other, other uh, top consuming countries. Uh, the, just as an interesting footnote, you can see the U.S. consumption has doubled literally in the last, you know, from 2004 to 2007. That was driven primarily because of the trans fat issue. Uh, companies moving away from hydrogenated oils to, uh, to palm oil and their various uh, processed foods. But you can just see the growth in India skyrocketing. You can see it uh, in uh, China and you can see it in, the, um, uh, in India as well. It's really kind of really driving the growth of uh, uh, consumption. So, what, what have been the impacts? This is just a, a graphic. We could do the same for Sumatra, just kind of showing how the land cover, the forest cover has changed on, on Borneo. Um, and you can see in this whole lowland area right here, in the uh, lower part here, that's uh, kind of the epicenter of where palm oil is now being developed in, in West and in central Kalimantan. And just flying over that area about a year or so ago, I mean, it's just li literally now just all blanketed with, with palm trees throughout. Um, so what have been the enabling conditions? What's, what's done this? First of all, it's highly profitable. Here's a crop where you were selling at one point, the price got up to uh, $1,200 a metric ton for something that cost $350 to produce. So highly profitable. Uh, for, for the producers. Relative to other oils, it's highly productive and a much lower price. You have weak governance systems and weak enforcement. Uh, you have strong support by both local and national governments that have really uh, been pushing the growth of palm. You have consumption growth primarily in China, India, and Indonesia. You have a wide range of unbranded products. So again, the vegetable oils that are sold in Southeast Asia are mainly unbranded. Uh, and it's a highly versatile oil with a wide range of applications so that it's being used in, in many different sectors. Um, when you take a look at the, the yield issue, uh, it's literally 10 times the yield of soy oil on a per hectare basis. Now you're seeing a movement right now in Europe in terms of, well, let's get out of palm oil entirely. Let's uh, uh, switch over to soy or to sunflower or other oils. The thing is, is that you know, for every hectare of palm oil that you take out, for every ton of palm oil that you take out of a company's supply chain, you're potentially adding two and a half hectares for soy to cover that. And so you really have some tough trade-offs here. So the, the, the main focus really should be getting palm oil right uh, and, and uh, rather than trying to substitute because from a land use perspective, uh, you will run into problems. You can see here the growth in Indonesia. Now, the, the yellow bars that you see there, we're going to talk about that later on, but you just have a, a, uh, just this rapid, rapid growth and a very young tree age distribution. And that's important because 
the younger tree age will raise the productivity and you've got all of these areas coming into production with very, very high productivity. And that's going to cause an interesting situation in the markets going forward. And I'll talk about that later on. You have yield and degraded lands presents a huge opportunity, but huge policy obstacles. This is a photo of an area that was burned out in the forest fires in 1998 in uh, West Kalimantan. It's completely covered in the Langalang grasslands. Um, you can go for 50 miles in any direction from here and see the same kind of landscape. This land cannot be planted in palm oil. The government won't let you. Okay, it's part of the forest estate within Indonesia, and as being part of the forest estate, it is prohibited to plant palm oil there. So you have a lot of areas that have been damaged, but there are policies and legal impediments to actually using these lands for expansion rather than forested areas. So it's a huge opportunity, but requires a change in policy. Then you've got the issue of... Uh, Enforcement. Now, this is just coming from you know the Jakarta Post, where uh, in central Kalimantan, where uh, the anti-judicial uh, mafia, as they call it, did a complete investigation of all of the uh, concessions that were granted, or uh, or not concessions granted, but the plantation and mining firms, 967 companies, uh, where they found only 76 had deforested legally. So you've got about 92% that were, uh, uh, where the deforestation was illegal. In the case of the plantations, it came out to 79%. So you just have kind of a systemic failure around the enforcement issues um, that just enables people to, to pretty much do what they want without any kind of uh, uh, repercussions or fear of accountability. This is another, another situation. This is the, the purple spots in this map here are what they call the ISM Locasi and the ISM Principis. And these are startup permits that uh, the, the local governments issue to companies that want to plant palm oil. They're all outside of the forest estate and they're all controlled by the local districts and the provincial governments. 5.3 million hectares of these permits were issued, of which only nine, uh, uh, 5.3 million hectares were issued, of which only 900,000 hectares were actually planted in palm oil. Uh, and so what this ended up being was really just a workaround to go out and log. And it, it's illegal to log in these areas, but it was a workaround. I'm going to take out the forest to plant palm oil, but their intentions were basically to take out the timber and, and, and to sell it off um, and never to plant the palm oil. So you have a, a whole other set of problems there. We're currently doing a study uh, in the Riau province uh, right now. We're taking a look at uh, just where the palm is being planted and overlaying that with uh, reserves and uh, parks and everything else and found that 25% uh, of the palm area just in the province of Riau is, on illegal, is illegally planted. 27 is legal and 48% uh, is unclear that needs further investigation. But 25% 20, planted in areas where it is illegal to produce. And so, again... It's, a, it's an issue of accountability. Then here we have the case of Tesonilo National Park. This is a, a park in, in the Rial province. 43% of this park has been completely overrun by palm oil, uh, not small holders. Uh, uh, average holding size is 50 hectares, uh, and most of it is recent. Um, and so you just see this uh, uh, concern where even, even national parks aren't safe. Uh, so you really have this accountability, this governance, and this enforcement issue that is one of the prime enabling factors that that is happening. If we take a look now at the sectors uh, in terms of the production countries, and just a quick overview in Malaysia, 29% uh, of Malaysian production is smallholder based, 9% in government hands, 62 in the private sector. And in Malaysia, what you see in the private sector piece, it really isn't that concentrated. Five companies control 15% of the production. So it's really not a very concentrated sector, uh, with, so it's got many, many players. When you go to Indonesia, the profile is fairly similar. It's got a bit more smallholders, uh, a bit more government, but 
When you get to the private sector, it's very concentrated. Six producers make up 60%. That's, you know, Golden Agri, Wilmar, and Astra are the top three producers in Indonesia. Very, very large companies with you know, hundreds of thousands of hectares in production, each of them in terms of uh, producing. So you've got two different, two different aspects. One are very concentrated and very powerful players, and in Malaysia, a much more uh, diffuse uh, and less concentrated industry. When you take a look at um, how palm oil is being used globally, a lot of people you know, think it's biofuels. Biofuels has not played a big, big role in palm. It's about 4% of total palm oil consumption. The main driver has been driven by cooking oil and food industry use. Uh, you're starting to see a lot in the oleochemical center, primarily driven more by palm kernel oil, but the primary use has always been really around food and biofuels increasing but has not played a significant role so far in, in the sector. If you take a look at the structure of the traders and the market summary, you've got in India, uh, your traders are Musimas and Wilmar. Uh, uh, Wilmar has 35% of the, uh, those two companies make up 35% of the trader market. It's very low concentration. In terms of the main use, so 72% is used as a cooking oil. 80% uh, of that cooking oil is unbranded, and its retail structure very, very fragmented. When you go to China, you've got Wilmar is 70% of the Chinese market. Uh, so a dominant company, one company, very, very dominant uh, uh, and very concentrated. In terms of its use, 46% in cooking oil, 16% in instant noodles. Uh, and it's a surprising thing. Instant noodles actually as a, as a product uh, across the board make up about 5% of global consumption of palm oil. So just the one product, you've got a uh, 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 fairly concentrated use. In terms of the Chinese market, in terms of the cooking oil, again, it's 64% on branded and uh, one company dominates with over 50% of the Chinese market. It's Master Kong, uses over a million tons of palm oil a year. And its retail structure, again, highly fragmented, a lot of mom and pop, but, but, but it's changing. When you go to Indonesia, like, you've got Wilmar, Golden Agri, and Musi Mas as the top traders of the oil. Again, Wilmar showing up. 80% of the consumption is as cooking oil. 75% uh, of that cooking oil is unbranded. And again, your retail is highly fragmented. And the EU, Cargill, Wilmar, Musi Mas, uh, uh, have about 75% of the European market, but Cargo and Cargill being the dominant player in the EU market. Um, the main uses, 54% as food use, and, um, and the oleochemical is, uh, as, as food use as ingredients, and the oleochemical and industrial products is growing within the EU. So the main takeaway here is that you're dealing, first of all, on the trader space, some very, very concentrated players with Wilmar being a dominant theme throughout this, right? Wilmar as a company has about 45% of global palm oil, okay? Um, so they're, they're a very, very dominant, dominant player in, in the supply chain. Uh, you, but you don't see much concentration on the retail or on the manufacturing end, uh, so the main place in terms of the overall supply chain really is, is in processing and trading, and Wilmar is the dominant player here. That is uh, uh, a critical component. So what's important about this analysis is really is helping us to figure out who do we focus on and who do we have to talk to and who do we have to change uh, in terms of making progress in, in the overall debate. If you take a look at a quick breakdown of the, uh, the traders, uh, again, Wilmar 45% on global, but it plays a dominant role in China, plays some role in India, and some role in Europe. But uh, the others, Cargill is only big in, in Europe, and Musi Mas uh, is the uh, leader in um, Musi Mas and, uh, whoops, and, and Wilmar are the two key players in India. Now, what's going on, as I was talking before in terms of global pricing, you're seeing a significant shift or change in uh, the marketplace right now, and it's actually an opportunity. 
Palm oil has been in short supply uh, literally for the last uh, eight, eight years or so. It's been very, very tight. And since I've joined WWF, this is the first time where I actually see that we do have an opportunity to influence now because price is coming way, way down. And so now it's going to be about market access. It is no longer a seller's market. It's going to be a buyer's market because we've got all of this production coming online. You can just see the historical pricing trends palm oil against soy and, and the canola oil. And you can just see the big separation happening right now on palm oil and the price is continuing to go down. And what's happening is, is that there's just been a massive buildup in inventory in production. They have too much in production. And the problem with the tree crop is you can't turn them off. Okay, so they're always gonna be producing that oil is always gonna be there. And so we're foreseeing that we will have a soft market going forward and that also we hope will slow down the expansion. So now, now to talk a little bit about the RSPO since uh, talking about sort of the, the efforts on certification and uh, kind of what's going on there. First of all, right now, you know, the RSPO uh, is probably the leading uh, voice or format where producers, NGOs, retailers, growers all get together uh, and are able to talk about uh, how to move the industry in the appropriate sector. It really hasn't, you know, it hasn't, uh, I would say from our perspective, it hasn't satisfied all of our requirements in terms of what WWF is looking for, but it is actually the only format forum where you've got where you can uh, have the discussions with the producers and move them to higher ground. Um, as a certification, it's done fairly well. Its uh, uptake has been about 12, 13% of global production, which isn't a bad place in the short time that it's been around. But the problem and the concern that I've got is that I think we've got sort of our limitations in that RSPO, when you take a look at the market, EU and US being about 12% of global palm oil, RSPO is around 12, 13%. We've really kind of saturated our natural market, if you will. And that if we're really gonna be successful, it's all about China, it's all about India, and it's all about Indonesia in terms of driving progress. The RSPO was set up to bring everyone together uh, to discuss and to come together with principles and criteria. Uh, around palm oil production. The standard went live in November 2008, uh, and it's been growing ever since. If you take a look at the makeup and how it's changed, and I know some of you have had questions about that, the RSPO started off literally with some of the more um, progressive producers or those willing to engage that were, uh, we'll say, had some kind of brand exposure. Companies like Syme Darby, United Plantations, which is uh, a Danish company, uh, as well as a few others, WWF, Unilever, uh, as a consuming company. And at that time when the RSPO started, the growers actually made up the major, major percentage. What you're seeing is a huge, huge shift though in the last few years, as you're starting to see a lot more of the consumer goods companies coming into the debate and becoming members of the RSPO. Um, and so that's, that's, brought a lot more pressure, but it's also to some degree, we're seeing a lot more polarization within the RSPO now in terms of how to move things forward. Membership right now is primarily Malaysia and Indonesia, and then every other company is pretty much Western. We do not, we're just starting to get Indian companies and Chinese companies to join, uh, but getting those companies into the RSPO to become part of the debate is gonna be very important. Right now, it is still very Western dominated. In terms of where the RSPO is right now, uh, it's got um, a total of 1.5 million uh, or 6.7 million tons of palm certified, of which they've sold slightly more than half. Uh, and so we're having a real uptake issue. The growers are all saying, as we want to increase the stringency of the standard, they're saying, why are we going to increase the barriers, increase the, the, the standard when at the same time that they aren't seeing any benefit or the, the buyers, the, the, the brands are not uh, stepping up to the plate and buying their oil. 
We also have added layers of complexity to this issue in terms of the supply chain management, which I think have also been barriers in terms of segregated and mass balance versus book and claim. Uh, you're seeing a, a growth in your, your book and claim uh, area, uh, or rather in your, in your segregated and your mass balance area um, that is, adds a lot of cost that also poses a barrier for the consumer goods companies in terms of buying, buying the physical oil rather than going through a book and claim system. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, the problem that we've got on the, the supply chain issue that makes it incredibly complex is that when you take palm oil and you fractionate it, uh, you can fractionate it into many different components and many different uh, uh, products. And the, the problem is how do you track all of that through a supply chain and keep it separate? That adds enormous cost to the supply chain, a lot of inefficiencies. And so that makes it very, very difficult and very, very costly to get you know, a specific fraction that is isolated, that has come from a certified plantation. Now, the book and claim system was set up to take a lot of that complexity out, at least during the initial stages. But the consumer goods companies have uh, a lot of concerns about whether or not the consumers would accept a book and claim system in the short term. Uh, and their feeling is, is that they have to have segregated oil rather than uh, a book and claim system. And so we've got this kind of a standoff with companies not willing to pay the huge inefficiencies it costs to segregate the palm oil um, and uh, an unwillingness to, to, to put a process in place that would get us there. So when you take a look at kind of the implications of that, what you see is you've got 6.7 million metric tons uh, produced, of which 3.5 roughly were sold. Of that 3.5, 984, just under a million was segregated and book and claim. All of that got sold. All of the other producers that had the certificates from the book and claim system, you know, you ended up with essentially a, a minority or 57% of the producers receiving absolutely no kind of premium or uptake for their oil because they were part of a book and claim system. And so it's just become enormously complex, but the problem is, is that the benefits aren't getting to the producers. Now, the companies that can do the book and claim are the big vertically, yes? Can you explain what a book and claim Book and claim system is a, you get certified, and so you have a plantation, say, for 10,000 tons. So you as a producer get a certificate for 10,000 tons, and there's a market called Green Palm where you can sell that. It's a secondary market. So he, as a producer, puts that certificate into that market, then a company like Unilever can go and say, I'll buy your certificate and buy it, and the money goes right back to the grower. The segregated system is you've got to keep the oil segregated and separate all the way through that supply chain. So from extraction, shipping, and refining and further fractionation, whatever, you have to keep it separate all the way through, right? That adds huge inefficiencies to the system and huge costs. Um, but it's the only way that a, 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 a brand can say, well, the palm oil that I've got in my product is actually certified, right? Um, book and claim facilitates that in terms of makes it easier at least to get benefits to a producer at least at the very beginning stages. If you get to say up to 50%, it's going to be a lot more cost effective to segregate because you're going to have that critical mass. But now you don't. And so it's just very, very expensive. So you have this problem with the uptake. The other problem is, is that those that produce the segregated are the Slime Darbies, the IOIs, these big vertically integrated companies that are all the way through the supply chain. Big plantation base, big refining base, big shipping base, the whole thing. So it's, for them, they can do it fairly easily. So when companies go out, they'll buy all their segregated, so they're getting that benefit. But on top of it, you know, this is where I think the consumer goods companies are making a big mistake. If they want to, they want to completely fill their requirements to be 100% certified, they'll buy certificates to make up the difference of what they need from the same people. So, you aren't getting a good distribution of benefits, so you have the grower saying, why do we have to certify, or why do we even have to increase the hurdle rate? Because we aren't getting any benefit. 
So you've got this big problem right now that they aren't seeing the benefits and we've got just companies very concerned about moving towards the book and claim system to help move, move the agenda forward, right? So it's, it's a bit of a problem. So, I mean, this is what this chart here is. We're at 12% now, and so, I mean, what we're suggesting is, is that everyone should be going with book and claim right now. There is no reason a company can't be 100% right now through book and claim. The certificates are there. Um, move, migrate to a mass balance system and then to segregated system as you increase your, your certification base from a production standpoint. Um, that way you avoid the economies of scale issue. Uh, you're taking a sort of a long-term sequence process approach to this. Um, but uh, unfortunately, right now, the, the consumer goods companies are just very concerned about how their consumers would perceive this in their product. And so that's kind of big, been the big standoff. Okay, so, so what's WWF doing in all of this? First of all, we've been working with a lot of the consumer goods companies, uh, getting them to make commitments uh, on 100% certified sustainable palm oil, uh, working with the Consumer Goods Forum and their declaration to eliminate deforestation from their supply chains, uh, and actively participating in the uh, RSPO and in various working groups within the RSPO. We've also completely revised our strategy to really bring China, India, and Indonesia into the fold and to build out our capacity, but also to engage the private sector and the governments in those countries to, uh, uh, to begin the discussions and, and to move, move the issue forward in those markets. Uh, and then on policy, looking at degraded lands, looking at the legality issues, and we'll be doing a few papers on uh, legality, uh, as well as looking at possible tariff tariff benefits or tariff, tariff incentives that may, may help move this along, principally in India where there seems to be interest in the government to do so. Um, so we're building out technical capacity in, in our key markets, as I said, uh, and building out the local capacity to engage the industry, expanding our eyes on the forest program. This is a, a program that we have in Sumatra looking at the pulp and paper sector that's doing a lot of uh, monitoring and GIS work on concessions uh, and having them move into the palm oil sector to start working on that. Um, and also uh, developing a much more global to local communication strategy. So current activities in China is working with the CFNA, it's a government trade agency, uh, trade association, very critical have taken them down to Indonesia, into Malaysia to, to see the problems in the field, have built out a retailer working group, have gotten state-owned enterprises like Kafka, which is the biggest uh, uh, importer in China, uh, to actually join the RSPO. And Kafka has actually, uh, just in December, brought in the first shipment of certified oil have actually built out a noodle round table because in China it's a huge, huge impact. I mean, Master Kong is huge and then working with the CGF companies. In India, uh, again, working with the retailer, uh, forming a retailer working group, working with the refiners, the government, and the CGF companies, uh, and Indonesia on the legality, smallholder certification, and working with the CGF companies there in terms of move, moving the agenda forward. That's pretty much it in terms of an overview. Thank you. Yep. Questions, Q and A. Sure. So what does Looks the same. Uh, physically, the oil, the, the, you can't tell one oil from another, but on the plantations itself, where it's developed, it's got your buffer zones, it's not planted on, in, in, uh, on deep peat, uh, it's not planted on steep hills. Uh, all your riparian areas are uh, HCV areas and, and reforested or forested. Um, and you've got your, your worker rights issues, your housing, medical care, and all of those issues uh, as part of the, the whole package. Yeah. So, related question What strategy do you have to work with Indonesia to try and come up with, overcome some of their policies? You seem to have the poor, the burn land that they can't plant on, you have the permits that they correct those, then that relieves a lot of pressure yeah. on cutting down these 
Right, and the problem that you're absolutely right, and the problems in Indonesia are just incredibly complicated. I mean, one of your biggest drivers is also just uh, the corruption that you have. The, the photo of the National Park that uh, you saw there, you have a, a member of the Indonesian legislature is one of the big investors in there, okay? You've got major players in the palm sector that have been buying up all of that production. You've got the uh, intelligence services of Indonesia involved as brokering the fruit coming out of that national park. So you've got some systemic issues that really have to be dealt with in a much broader thing. Changing the, changing the policies but not working on the, the, the enforcement and the legality issues are going to be really big. I mean, this is really one of the biggest problems that we face really is going to be this corruption issue, right? We're, we're providing a lot of information to all of the uh, corruption forces that are there in terms of mapping out the concessions, identifying the Ill illegality issues and all of that. And hopefully in the next couple of weeks or so, you'll be seeing something coming out specifically on this whole investigation on the National Park in terms of what was behind it, who was behind it. Uh, one of the uh, sort of uh, Tempo magazine, which is very similar to sort of the Indonesian, very much a, uh, uh, a name and shame type of magazine or 60 Minutes news magazine in Indonesia that both in Bahasa and in English is, has a whole investigative team going through this whole thing. So we want to expose it, bring it, bring it out because it's got to become part of the debate, right? But it's, it's a huge issue in Indonesia. And it's not just palm, it goes to fishing, it goes, it goes to pulp and paper, every, every sector there. I mean, it's a, it's a you know, systemic issue. Yes. How does the production costs of palm coming off of large onions compare to the coming off of different types of? It's terrible. It's terrible. The uh, the, the the peatlands, you mean? Yeah. Uh, that that has to be one of the dumbest things I've ever seen. Of people planting on peat. Uh, if you go to a plantation that's planted on peat uh, and it's fairly old, what you see is the the trees laying on their sides, falling down. Uh, very, very difficult to fertilize, uh, very, very weak root systems, and just terrible, terrible productivity. Um, when Greenpeace went after Golden Agri, uh, one of the declarations that Greenpeace had Golden Agri signed was no more peat. Um, you know, it said that, you know, Frankie Wajaya said, well, that's, that's a good thing. We shouldn't be planting on peat. It was dumb to begin with, right? Uh, what makes peat attractive is its availability. Okay, and that's, that's the issue. It's about land and its availability. And so if you've got nothing or peat, people are choosing peat. And you're seeing a lot of peat in, in the smallholder context in terms of people, smallholders holding up, planting another couple of hectares on peatland because it's available. But it's, from a production standpoint, it's, it's not good at all. How about, for example, like a pasture? Can you expand the pasture compared to a smallholder? Sure. You can plant pastures very easily. And, and they'll, they'll produce fine. I mean, that's the, the, that whole degraded lands issue in terms of in the Indonesian context, it's really about the alang, -alang grasslands. And these, these are just extensive grasslands that take over after the fires uh, have come in. Many people thought that you couldn't plant palm in, in, in those areas because the grass is just too aggressive or the fire risk was too high but you can eradicate the, the alang alang fairly easily and fairly quickly. In fact, it's more cost effective to do that than it is to clear a, a secondary forest to plant palm. Yes? Um, what effect has RSPA had on rural communities in Indonesia? On? To some degree, I would say really good. I mean, uh, I got to go see the, uh, the Hindoli plantation that uh, has a big smallholder independent grower community uh, that, uh, you know, the plantation team there was working very, very closely with the smallholders, driving, you know, helping provide input, technical assistance, all of that kind of uh, support. Um, they're certified to RSPO, highly, highly productive. I mean, they were getting very, very good yields. Uh, and then you go into the towns, and what you're seeing is sort of the, you know, the, the Indonesian McMansions popping up. Uh, you're seeing uh, banks and you're seeing commerce spreading. And you really could see an increased 
and, and livelihoods. Um, and some of the more remote areas, uh, you know, in terms of providing community services, uh, electricity, water, most of the plantation companies do that. Uh, educational facilities, uh, medical facilities, they all, those are all part of sort of that plantation package, if you will, and for the most part are available to the locals. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's only um, from what I've seen. I haven't seen the horror stories, right? Uh, those are very hard to get into. Yes? Yeah, the smallholder certification is uh, a difficult issue. Uh, I think someone had asked the question about the Thailand experience and how, how you know, how that worked out uh, with the smallholders. Um, that cost the IFC something like $2 million, right, to get that smallholder group uh, certified. Uh, we're, we're working with one group. The first thing that you really have to do is aggregate some kind of co-op, a lot of training, uh, a lot of education uh, in terms of uh, bringing them online. I, I think their biggest problem that they've got long term with the smallholders though really has more to do with one, very, very poor yields, most of them, because they're very extensively cultivated. Uh, and so they're viewed more as an opportunistic crop rather than uh, a managed crop. But then on top of that, uh, you have the issues of poor germplasm. They're planting roadside FFB, which basically back crosses to the parent material and a much, much lower yield as well. And so. Um, but to get them certified, it requires infrastructure. I mean, we're building some of that out. Groups like Soledadidad are building that out. IDH is building that out. Uh, but it is, a, it, it is a massive task. The plantation companies, for the most part, aren't stepping up to that in terms of working with the independent smallholders. And it's kind of one of the strangest things I've seen because when, when I was in the plantation business, we always would want to work with our smallholders and get them the best technology, make sure they had the, the, the fertilizers and everything else, make sure that they were trained because as they benefited, we would benefit as well. Um, but over there, they just don't see it that way. And so there's very much, very much a separation on, uh, on quite a bit, especially with the independent smallholders that aren't affiliated with any kind of uh, plantation company. Yes? Give me an example. Like, say, you know, Jade Drum Coffee or Jade Drum only in the same area. Can you do anything similar with Palmetto? Some people have raised cattle underneath, but more in the, in the, older, in the older cultivations. Um, but years ago, we tried to grow papaya. Uh, didn't work out too well. Um, haven't seen, haven't seen really much on that. Where, where we're seeing that really emerging is more in the coconut, coconut and cacao interplanting. Okay, uh, and hopefully we'll be getting a project up and running down that in the Philippines. But uh, uh, again, smallholder and more livelihoods driven. But uh, uh, no, it's really not. It's not front and center within the industry. It's, it's still pretty much a, a monocrop. But, but within that, you know, one of the big paradigms within sort of the uh, palm plantation, and, and you're starting to see some of that in, uh, in terms of letting the understory grow, right, uh, and letting that build up. Uh, uh, and I've seen a few plantations doing that more on an experimental base and monitoring for uh, changes in biodiversity and that kind of thing, but nothing on a large scale, right? Sure. Jeremy? I'm wondering if the Gulf RCA sees 35% percent of Palmolive production, or if it's going to go to the Pacific Island top um, um, 20, 30, 50%, um, and keep raising the bar? I wish I could answer that. Um, the, the, thing, the, the way I would look at it is that you know, if, if we aren't 100% successful, we failed, okay? 
uh, if, you, if you get 80%, you still got 20% doing the damage, and they can do considerable damage, right? But I think we've got to, you know, some of the, the good developments that are happening, or at least I perceive them as good, we'll see how they play out. Uh, as the RSPO has been gaining force or traction within the sector, you're seeing a, a concerned response by the governments, both Indonesia and Malaysia, okay? Indonesia is now, has come out with the ISPO, Indonesian Sustainable Palm Oil, which essentially is mandatory. It's mandatory compliance with some of the laws of Indonesia, and so they're gonna really make sure that some of the laws are being followed and audit all the plantations, and by 2015, all plantations have to be certified in Indonesia with ISPO. Malaysia is following up with something similar. Now, to, to some degree, I mean, you know, some say that that's a bad thing that's going to create competition, but I think what it is really doing is just shoring up the bottom. I mean, at the end of the day, how we would spell success right now is how do we stop the deforestation, right? Um, and um, so, you know, I, I don't think the RSPO can do that, uh, and I think we need many other di different type of interventions. Uh, it's not just, there, there is no silver bullet in this. You've got to work on many, many different angles, right? I'm interested in your, the strategy on the consumer. So it's one to focus in on the DE label makers in China. Right. Because you said that they represent somewhat of a, like, I don't know, 4% or 50%. Well, globally, but in China, it's something like 12% of Chinese palm oil. Right. 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 Well, yeah, it's it, it's you know get, getting the noodle manufacturers, and what we really want to do is we want the phones ringing from Beijing to Jakarta. You know, I need sustainable palm oil, right? Uh, and so we're meeting with uh, Master Kong and other noodle manufacturers uh, on uh, on the issue. Uh, the latest report that we've had is getting Master Kong to join RSPO, and that's in discussions right now to get them involved, to take them down there so that they can see, see the impacts. And that's one of the things that we have found has been very effective. Taking you know, these corporate executives to see what's going on is very, very effective because they don't want to be a part of it. When they see it in, uh, up front and close, most are, are, are angered, okay? Um, on top of that, we're working with the CFNA, which helps establish the policies for Ministry of Commerce and all of that, educating them on RSPO uh, to get the Chinese government involved because the Chinese, in China, anything you do, you really have to have the government behind you, right? So if the government moves, and that's why, you know, having Kafka coming in and now bring in the first load of CSPO is a good thing because it's starting to lay down a marker. Now, the thing, you know, from a political standpoint, palm oil is not a big issue in China, right? Uh, because China's main source of oil is soy. Uh, and so, you know, when we brought the palm oil issue even to our own colleagues in WWF China, you know, what are you talking about? We barely use the stuff, but it's all relative, right? It's big, uh, China's big to palm oil, but palm oil is not big to China, right? And so, it requires a lot of education. And so bringing the issue to them, getting companies like Kafka, getting the CFNA involved, and getting Master Kong and the noodles, as well as the retailers. Had a number of meetings with various retailers uh, uh, and uh, consumer goods uh, firms uh, trying to get them to step up. But the big surprise was, you know, in uh, about November, I was having lunch with Wilmar in, in China, and... Um, Wilmar's people in China did not know anything about RSPO, right? And so it just, how do you penetrate that? Don't know. It's just multiple, multiple activities and a lot of education. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. Um, for 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 two, two two reasons. First of all, is just taking a look at the lands that are available. Uh, we've got to deal with those policy issues. You know, those low carbon lands, and they're there, right? 
Uh, there's actually a map of that low carbon lands will be published very, very soon globally in terms of the, the tropical areas. Where are these areas that are, you know, 30 tons uh, uh, of carbon or less? Um, so you can do that. Uh, second of all, there's huge, huge upside in yield. I mean, if you take a look at, you know, your best companies are getting 7, 7.5 tons of oil per hectare, okay? Indonesia's average is 3.9, so there's a big upside on that as well. Then there's also new varieties and uh, new, I mean, Syme Darby has a, has a clone out right now that is reportedly getting something like 11 tons of oil per hectare. And so there's still, palms are relatively new cultivation and they're just starting to bring a lot of the technology and breeding to it. It takes, you know, just to get a, a palm oil variety clone tested and everything else, it takes about 20, 25 years. And so they're, uh, you know, you're starting to see some of that, that, that paying off. But I do think it's possible. It's just a question of, you know, building out and getting the, the policies right and moving the industry in the right direction, right? Yes? And which one? The, the one that I talked about in Sumatra? It's, it's acted upon constantly on the pulp and paper, on the pulp and paper sector. It's a, it's a ongoing effort there. The, the numbers that I gave you on Real right now, that is going to be in a report coming out hopefully uh, in the next month or so, okay, uh, in terms of publishing the, the preliminary analysis of what they found in Real in terms of the legality. Um, our, our pivot for Indonesia right now is really going to be to start talking about legality in a much more public fashion, right, to get that issue out. Because it's, if you bring the legality issue out, I mean, if you look at it this way, Indonesia's what, 52, 53% of global palm oil. A company like Unilever uh, is not going to want to buy palm oil that may be tainted with National Park, okay? And so if you're able to tie those supply chains with legality, you're going to end up forcing the companies and the traders to start doing that due diligence and, and enforcing that because it's just going to, you know, they're going to need market access. And access is going to be a big issue as you see their inventories building up and, and prices going down, right? And so really pushing that part of the, the, the thing will help those companies respond. We've talked with Wilmar. Wilmar's policy has been we will not be policemen for the industry, right? But the biggest problem that they have uh, as a company, and they openly admit it, we don't even know where our oil comes from, okay? Now, here's a company that trades 45% of global palm oil and has absolutely no traceability, right? That's not a good place to be. So do you see the Indonesian government playing any role? They're going to have to. They're going to have to. Okay. They're going to have to because it becomes a very much a reputational issue for Indonesia, right? Palm oil is important in Indonesia. Huge, huge revenues for the Indonesian government. Market access is huge. Right now, I mean, the Indonesian government is lobbying very, very hard the US EPA to get palm oil uh, approved as a biofuel for, for, for the US. Because what they've got to do, they've got this huge inventory that's building on this wall of oil that's going to be coming online. They've got to expand the uses, or it's just going to fill up all the tanks over there. right? So they've got to find additional uses for palm oil. So they're really lobbying very, very hard. You know, the, our contacts in the EPA and Department of State are telling us it's an incredibly sensitive issue with the U.S. government right now. So bringing the legality issue out is very, very important for us to do, right? Yes? <sighs> right now, we don't recommend it as a biofuel. Absolutely not. I mean, the last thing, and, and, and we've told this very, very clearly, I mean, uh, told it directly to the Minister of Forestry. I said, why would we want to encourage U.S. consumers to help destroy national parks? Until you can show me that you can protect your parks, we aren't going aren't, aren't to encourage the consumption. Yes? Could you speak up a little bit? Right. And so I was wondering if you see the demand as advantageous or not. Is it all not, not really. It's, uh, the problem is, I mean, the U.S. is only 2%. Uh, 
I mean, I'd rather spend my time, I hate to say it, on noodles. <laughs> I mean, it's just bigger bang for buck, right, uh, uh, in terms of the U.S. is only 2% of the market. Yes, it's very important. It's very important. And, and for the most part, most of the brands have been very, very active. I mean, you know, I'm surprised at a lot of the, what a lot of the companies have been doing. Um, in terms of really driving driving the conversation, I mean, there's a whole group that is, you know, quietly talking to the Indonesian government. Fix this. We want to do business with you, but we can't, you know, we can't constantly have these type of problems, whether it's palm oil or whether it's pulp and paper. You guys have to get this under control, right? So we're trying to bring the commercial arguments to the government so that they understand that that this also is about money. And it's also about their essentially licensed to operate. They're playing on a global stage now. Yes? What kind of parallels do you guys draw with the foreign international government in Brazil and the role of the Democratic Party in the world now? Yeah, G great question. Um, I, I'm a fan of really just laying out, let's do that land use planning exercise. Let's lay out where you can or cannot plant. And that's essentially what the soy moratorium did. Absolutely no expansion in the Amazon, right? But let's define those areas, right? And I think that that's something that really has to happen. Um, and really take a look at a lot of those policy interventions, whether it's the forest estate or outside of the forest estate, to see where are the most suitable places that do the least damage, right? Um, in terms of, uh, of a moratorium, soy, soy in Brazil was easy because, you know, it's so dependent on Europe, okay? And so it was really, you, you had a lot of market pressures there. Uh, you don't have that with palm oil. So to, to get everyone to agree to any kind of stopping the moratorium, unless the Chinese, the Indians, and the Indonesians say no, it's not going to happen. Yes? Um, you know, in China, you see a lot of concern around the environmental issues growing, but it's really about what's front and center to them in terms of whether it's the water or the pollution in Beijing or what have you, something that is very, very uh, close to them. They, they have very, very little knowledge about uh, the palm oil issue in general, uh, and um, the, the consumption pattern of this, I mean, it's an unbranded product that's going through such, you know, wide-ranging distribution networks and things like that. I think it would be very, very hard to really get consumers up and running. We're, we want to focus our time and energy more on government and, on, you know, those key state-owned enterprises as well as uh, the CGF firms and, and the noodle guys.